Good morning, everybody. It's really good to be here. Wow, I'm just taking it all in, seeing all of you again. It's been a long time. really good to be here and see your faces and be in your presence. Okay. Been through a lot, and it's good to be here. I um, said this morning in the pre-talk, um, whenever I get a message from Leslie about an opportunity to come and be here and talk with you, I always say, yes, I'm I'm eager to do it, and I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and I just kind of wait and kind of clear the, the desk, and things start to show up. It's quite a process. It's always a journey. I never know where it's going to go or what it's going to be. Um, and so here it comes. What? <laughs> um, we're well into fall already. This time when nature tells us it's time for life to go back underground, time for inner work and reflection and contemplation. And it's October 31st, Halloween. I see a lot of it here. You're wearing it. Since ancient times, this hallowed eve has been a time to remember the ancestors and the friends and the loved ones gone from this world time of ghosts and shadow, when all that scares and haunts us walks the streets and comes knocking door to door. It's a time to remember our collective holy ones and wise elders whose actions and ideals have brought healing and peace, who asked for what they really wanted in life, created new possibilities, and asked us to evolve. This day, since ancient times, has been known as a threshold time, a thin place, a place where the two worlds touch. Rumi says, today, the door is round and open. People are going back and forth across the door sill. Stay awake, listen, ask for what you really want. Um, there's a spiritual teacher and writer, Frank McEwen, he writes a lot about Celtic spirituality, and he says, a materially focused culture perceives time and history as linear and one-dimensional, as if energies, subtle realities, relationships, and experiences from the past have no bearing on the present and the future. But for people all over the world, the realm of the ancestors is a living reality. For many, ancestors are not disconnected from life, Rather, they spiral back into the present as a living influence. Very early on in my life, my perception of reality was definitely not one-dimensional. I had a very robust conversation going on with the spirit world. It was constantly spiraling into my present. It was called a wild imagination at school and it was particularly active in math class. <laughs> and I soon learned how many people in my world had a very different perception of reality, and I learned to keep my conversations to myself. Some of it may have had something to do with the way I grew up. My dad was an Episcopal priest. Our first church was St. Peter's in Maryland. It was an old red brick church with a heavy structure of dark wooden rafters. My dad always said a door to a church should always be wide and open, and it was. So bats and pigeons were often sailing through this church, as well as people who would come in because they just needed a place to sit down or they needed to light a candle. There was no rectory at this church, so we lived in what had been the sacristy, and there wasn't a lot of room. So the solution was that as long as nothing was going on at church, we could play in there. Our entrance was through my parents' bedroom, 
you would just open the door and there were these long blue velvet curtains and you'd feel for the break and the part, break them apart and you'd step into this other world. It was filled with the scent of incense, the glint of gold mosaic, dark wood. There was a white marble altar, a thick oriental rug. There were swirling mandalas and flying dragons. There were beams of light that streamed through stained glass windows and spilled into pools of colors that were big enough to stand in. And best of all were the red and green votive lights that twinkled silently in the dark recess under the choir loft far in the back. You could light them with these th thin, long tapers of wax. And I understood that this was a communication system with the spirit world and I like to keep it all lit up. Some days, Dad would let us know that Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so from the parish had died and they were going to need the church, so we needed to find another place to play. We never knew exactly what was going on, but we were told it was a mystery. And always fresh cloths would be laid, flowers would arrive, candles would be lit, favorite songs selected. There'd be a lot of incense and the place would become a portal, round and open, so people could pass through. Fast forward, when I was in college in Mexico City, and our professor took us to the celebration of the Day of the Dead. I mentioned this here once before at C3. It made such an impression on me as we wound our way for hours through this enormous labyrinth of altars, food, flowers, fragrance, candlelight, mandalas of color, smiling skeletons, painted skulls. So many people were going back and forth across that door sill. It was round and open, and it felt good to be in a place where the realm of the ancestors is a living spiritual reality. In Central America, I encountered that door sill again. It was different than St. Peter's or Mexico it was a time of war. There was a lot of shock and trauma. It was the first time I saw and heard raw grief, where I understood that human violence and war lays a lot of pain on the door sill, and that crossing back and forth can get very complicated. Florentina is a friend of mine and her husband was killed in an attack on their village, leaving her with five children. But everybody in that community knew that Jose Angel was still around. Tina would talk about his visits as she made coffee by the fire just after dawn. She said sometimes it was just a brush of energy, soft as a feather. Sometimes he would slip between the wall and the bed. He would tell her, check on a certain cow Time to plant the corn. Get ready to pull the beans. Once he showed her of a place, a picture of a place, in Italy, and years later their daughter ended up living there. It was clear he was watching over everything. One day we hiked up to Tina's favorite place, a large stand of pine trees. It was high up and hard to get to, but it had this view that was forever and it was worth the journey. During the war, it had been a hiding place and a lookout. Her kids had come along with us. The wind was blowing through the pines that day, and the girls grew agitated. They wanted to leave. They didn't like that sound of the wind in the pines. It scared them. They told stories of hiding there during the war. And as they shared those difficult memories, a swirl of little yellow butterflies appeared and was circling and spiraling and the wind seemed to settle, and the girls watched those butterflies intently. And one whispered, shh, my papa is here. And we stayed in that place for a long time. Jean is a friend of mine who I know from years and years of human rights work. And when she was a little girl, her mom died, so she was raised by her grandparents. She went to work in Guatemala with a human rights organization. 
and she was living in a barrio just on the outskirts of Guatemala City where houses are perched high on steep slopes. And one morning on her way to work, she was assaulted by a group of men and they threw her over a cliff edge and she fell into a deep ravine below. She had serious injuries and she was recovering. So I went to visit to support her and we retraced her steps that she had taken that morning. She wanted to show me what had happened. So I looked down at the rock face below and saw where she had fallen. And I said, how did you survive? That's impossible. And she said, my mother caught me. Berto Oliva, my friend, <laughs> She works with the families of the disappeared, the forcibly disappeared in Honduras. And these families live on the threshold. Um, their loved ones have been forcibly disappeared and there's no body to bury, no death to declare. And anybody who spends time in their office will hear the stories. They're very matter of fact about it, that the disappeared show up there because that is their home. Those who arrive early to work or stay late often catch a glimpse. They've been known to rearrange the furniture. One time I took a body worker there, a very skilled massage therapist, to work on the staff as part of a program of self-care. And they had cleared a space for her to work in. It was in a room where they keep all the photographs of the disappeared and the banners and the signs that they use in their monthly vigils to search for them. She was getting ready and I went in to check to see if she needed anything else. And she said, no, I'm good. Um, there was no room in here, but I asked them to step back and we're fine now. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, the disappeared. There's a lot of them here. A few years ago, on the anniversary of his disappearance, Berta's husband came to her and he said, time is short, Berta. How are you gonna leave all of this? In response, she began a program to work with the next generation of children and grandchildren of the disappeared who will inherit the burden of intergenerational trauma so that they will understand what happened and so that they can speak for their ancestors. This summer, the unmarked graves of indigenous children were located at the sites of residential boarding schools. I sent condolences to a friend of mine. She wrote back, they found more children. We are so sad. Our community has come together to honor those who survived the schools. We held ceremony to welcome home the children who have been gone for too long. We've erected altars all along the trails at a local native site. Artists were invited to erect them to show and release the pain. The healing is just beginning. It may never be finished. Thank you for your prayers and thoughts. My uncle is from Japan and I've told the story here about he, how he cared for his partner my Uncle Bill, when my Uncle Bill was on his door sill, struggling with cancer. And since Bill died, it's been many years now, <laughs> Shigeru has kept an altar for him in their home. It's set with candles, favorite incense, his bodhisattva, all the things he loved and wanted in life. Last year, their best friend, Bob, died. So now there's an altar for Bob, also right next to Bill, and it's set with the things he loved and wanted in life. For my uncle Shigeru, the realm of the ancestors is a living spiritual reality. And last September, when my sister was murdered in a racially motivated double homicide, we traveled with my uncle Shigeru to her memorial service. This was at a different church. This time it was in Pennsylvania where I lived during my high school years. It was a different place. It had a rectory, a very large one, and the door was not always quite as open. The 
but that's where we went. It was a requiem mass. We were seated in this enormous nave of the church with its vaulting arches and large side chapels. There was a thick printed bulletin. And at the head of the center aisle was a small table with the urn that held my sister's ashes. The ritual was ancient. There was a lot of incense. The music was gorgeous. It was a way to honor her. But what I really wanted was for the truth about what happened to her and to so many whose lives are taken by racism and by guns to be acknowledged, to be spoken to, and not be bypassed. I wanted everybody in that church to stay awake to the trespass of so much killing and war made easy by guns killing that all of our spiritual traditions teach us thou shalt not do, and yet continues to be enabled and profited from without end in our society, and the sermon did not do that. Things were transitioning quickly to the communion part of the service, and all of this was churning away wildly inside of me, and I heard myself say, do something. But it was an internal silent rebellion. I didn't want to make a scene. It wasn't the moment. But I must have asked for what I really wanted because precisely at that moment, I noticed this movement out of the left eye at the far end of the very long pew that we were seated in alongside a side chapel where an enormous wooden sculpture of a crucified Jesus hangs on the wall. My uncle Shigeru had risen to his feet. And every head in that church turned. All eyes were on him. The woman who was across the aisle from me had been filming the mass. She turned the camera off, and she looked to the priest as if to say, this is not in the program. His shoulders were shaking. His whole body was shuddering. The place went silent. You could hear a pin drop as my uncle slowly made his way across the entire front of the church. So silent that everyone could hear him sobbing. They could hear the garbled, choking sound of raw, primal grief and see tears streaming down a red and anguished face. And everyone was awake as he stepped into that center aisle and stood facing my sister's ashes. And with his whole body shaking and heaving, he made a deep ceremonial bow to her in his tradition. And then he turned to his chi her children and made a second deep bow. And one last turn to us, and he made a third bow with his whole body full and deep and low and down towards the ground. Then slowly he made his way back across the entire front of the church, stepped back into the pew and took his seat right next to that enormous Jesus. And without uttering a single word, this man who does not go easily into any church had did what I really wanted. He gave the sermon, he made the ceremony, he showed and released the pain, he acknowledged what had happened to her and to so many whose lives continued to be taken by guns. He told the truth, he said, stay awake to the trespass of all this killing. He said, do something. The two worlds were touching and no one was asleep. So much was crossing over that door sill. It was wide and round and open. When we got back to his house days later, he grabbed a few flowers from the yard on the way in and went right to the altars and put them down. He said, Jenny, light the incense. Let them know we're home. This spring, back in the town where my sister's memorial was held, 
an ecumenical coalition organized a gun violence awareness day. They made t-shirts with the names of all of those who'd been killed by guns in the area. They stretched across lawns and the entryways of churches. It was good to see the churches become door sills for all of those ancestors to come spiraling back into the present as a living influence, asking us to do something, helping us to evolve. My sister Amy says that what helped her is the healing power of music. And in particular, this one song. She said, it's by Dion. It's about Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and John Kennedy. The song is a lament, and it's sung from the place where the two worlds touch. It calls out, has anybody here seen my old friend Abraham? How about Martin? John? I just looked around, and they were gone. Didn't you love the things they stood for? Didn't they try to find some good for you and me? They freed a lot of people. But it seems the good, they die young. I just looked around and they were gone. She says, this song always has moved me to pathos and wonder. She says, I hear it now with a new sorrow. I find myself cathartically humming it and adding other verses. I find myself humbly weaving my sister into the thick spiral of ancestors and wise elders who asked for what they really wanted, an end to injustice and racism and violence for healing, for peace, and for us to evolve. She found a song for the door sill, and she's sharing it with everybody, and we're all humming it and adding verses. Social change leaders and spiritual teachers, medical professionals, poets, all of these fields that I am in contact with and reading and that are teachers for me and guides for me, from all of these, they're increasingly pointing to this door sill place, this place where the two worlds meet, as a site that is important for social change. Because of its potential to heal and integrate individual, collective, ancestral, and historic trauma and to help us to evolve. The science of epigenetics is pointing to what spiral-oriented people have always said, that unmetabolized violence, grief, trauma, spirals into the next generations, shaping the present and the future. Thomas Hubel is a spiritual teacher and social change leader who works internationally. He says, the collective trauma we are born into that has been passed to us and that we will pass to our children is evident in war, gun violence, climate catastrophe, inequality, racism, and misogyny. These unresolved systemic oppressions are passed down through generations and compound with each successive cohort. The mass accumulation of suppressed shadow works beneath the surface like tectonic plates and eventually the profound pressure they generate create social eruptions. The conflict and violence we see and point to patterns and systems in need of transformation. Resma Menekem is a healer and an expert on conflict and violence. He's <coughs> written a book called My Grandmother's Hands. He says we all need to spend time on the door sill and contact the heal and heal the historic and ancestral trauma that we carry that is a living influence on the present. He says the trauma that now lives in the bodies of so many African Americans did not begin when those bodies first encountered white ones. This trauma can be traced back much further through the generations of white bodies to medieval Europe 
to systems of empire that dispossessed and brutalized generations of ancestors. And then that violence was blown through red, black, and brown bodies. He says, for the US to outgrow white-bodied supremacy, white bodies need to imagine themselves in black bodies and what those bodies endure. They also need to do the same with the bodies of their own white ancestors. He says, if we don't address this ancient historic trauma, we will continue to pass it down to our children, their children, and grandchildren. Dr. Gabor Mate is a medical doctor in Canada. He's for decades worked on the door sill. And he's dedicated his life to understanding the connection between illness, addiction, trauma, and society. He says the US is the richest country in the world and in history, but all is not well. Anxiety, depression, chronic illness, and substance abuse are epidemic. Suicide is the most common cause of death in the US for youth aged 15 to 24. He says these are symptoms of a culture and a society in which trauma is endemic and systemic. He says what we call civilization demands the denial of human needs and the rights of the natural world. It may not po be possible to be a human being in what we call civilization, he says. Just as individuals and families have histories in which they transmit trauma across the generations, so do societies. He says we need to do something about it and has a new documentary called The Wisdom of Trauma. He says it's time to stop passing our disconnection and pain, time to see and hear our stories of intergenerational, ancestral, and historic trauma because it is the very doorway to healing lives and society. Dr. Mate is asking for what he really wants. He says, we will hold the vision of a world that breaks free of cycles of violence and trauma that becomes more open, round, inclusive, just, and peaceful. And it all starts with us, truly. When we allow our wounds to teach us about listening and compassion and to remind us of the preciousness of life. That truth will open our hearts and our innate wisdom can begin to shine through. That innate wisdom shines through the horses that I partner with at the Red Horse Center for Collaborative Leadership. They are adept at navigating between the worlds. Again and again, we witness the mystery of how without uttering a single word, they lead the way right to the wound in human beings and the systems we create, show and release the pain and point to the doorway so we can pass through, so that we can become more whole, evolve and create societies and systems that care for human beings and the natural world. The list goes on of teachers and leaders who are pointing to this door cell where the two worlds touch as a place to spend time with the living influence of the ancestors in all of their light and shadow to listen to their secrets, metabolize, heal, and free the future. So at this threshold time, when so many life forms are threatened by the domain of our collective shadow. Thank you for spending time this morning on the door sill. A special thank you to all of you at C3 who vigil for peace each week, who stand in that thick spiral of ancestors asking for what we really want. And on this hallowed eve, stay awake to what knocks on your door May our imaginations always be wild and do something. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. 
don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Thank you.